Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Ben Thomas. I am the uh, head of Worldwide Security SA. With me up here on stage, uh, my co-presenter, Alex Waddell. He's a senior security SA out of EMEA. Um, so just so we know who we're talking to first, whose primary role is audit compliance? Security? Other? Is that dev? Like, keep your hand up. Is, is it dev? Is it operations? Yeah? Great, great. Um, so you're at using AWS security services to build cloud security operations baseline, uh, GRC302. And uh, let's, uh, let's get going, Alex. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to start with uh, a little bit about some compliance challenges that you might experience when running your workloads in cloud. Then we're going to talk briefly about how workloads with different compliance needs can be baselined using a common set of security capabilities. And then next up, we're going to spend really the majority of our time breaking down the cloud security capabilities that you can deploy across uh, your entire AWS cloud environment to build your cloud security operations baseline and then we'll wrap up with some uh, calls to action. Great, so we speak to a lot of customers that are in various stages of their cloud adoption journey. Cloud's a dynamic space. The pace that, that people are building and innovating is really fast. Um, and then a lot of times, just even different teams at companies are at different levels of familiarity or maturity with cloud. The number of services the developers can use is huge. And while all this is going on, we still have to meet a range of different compliance and security demands. Um, it's a lot to think about and a lot to deal with. Um, raise your hand if like the challenges up here or anything I've said resonates with you, stuff you're running, two hands, all right. Yeah, so Quite definitely good. seeing some of this. So good, so um, you're in the right session, especially double, double hands up. Um, a lot of the, the baseline capabilities that we're gonna talk about today are things you can deploy in your business to help address a lot of these challenges and really allow you um, and your application developers just to build fast, great products uh, and services for your customers. So, so different baselines for, for different workloads. This is, this is a question I think a, a lot of people probably have now that we're starting this, Alex. So yeah. um, do I have to customize this kind of baseline security for um, the different workloads my, uh, my teams are putting in cloud? Well, let, let's think about a couple of, of different workloads that a typical customer might be running. Uh, on the left up here, you'll see we've got a classic three-tier web application. And one of the application teams has built this and they're using a mix of EC2 instances with the web app behind an application load balancer and some database instances across multi-AZ. Kind of your classic compute workload type of uh, setup. And then on the right, we've got a serverless web app and that's a, been built by a different team using serverless services like um, uh, Amazon API Gateway, Amazon Dyn DynamoDB and, and a bunch of others. And then in addition to all of that, we've got the security team and the compliance teams. And they're often working across different parts of the organization, trying to ensure that the security configurations are applied consistently and that you know, compliance requirements are being met. So what does the customer do? They've got two different workloads, different, uh, potentially different compliance needs. Do they build and deploy different uh, security and compliance services that's unique to each of those types of workloads? To me, and I'm sure to Ben as well, that probably doesn't feel like that's the kind of thing that's going to scale particularly well. And this is just two types of workload. You've probably got many different types of workloads. What they could consider instead is to deploy a set of security services that meet a common set of needs from the security and the compliance teams. That would be pretty cool. And it might then enable the security and the compliance teams to start to innovate and spend more time on that unique security and compliance requirements of those specific workloads. And that's what we would call our baseline cloud security capabilities. So, so the goal here, Alex, then is really to kind of get, if we're using the 80-20 rule, to get 80% um, of the stuff taken care of yep. just across the whole AWS estate for your organization. Yeah. 
And then maybe that last little bit of 20% customization, yep. you know, that we might end up doing on a workload. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. So um, we can think about a uh, security baseline for cloud in four different groupings, or we've grouped it up into four to talk about today. So identifying asset and compliance requirements, protecting infrastructure and data, detecting threats and vulnerabilities, and then finally monitoring you know, security effectiveness. So it's important to note that like, these aren't necessarily in any particular order. Your organization may have um, already addressed this. You may have cloud security or compliance goals this year that fall into one or other bucket or just um, you know, want to focus on a specific areas. But we just grouped them this way based on the capabilities so we can, we can go through them today. So first, we're going to talk about identifying assets and compliance requirements. I mean, you, it's really important to know what you have, where it is, and um, how it needs to be, or how they've been configured and secured, so you can understand your like, current compliance state and any work that needs to be done for the team uh, or other groups. We're going to talk about five services today. So AWS organizations, Control Tower, Config, Macy, and Security Hub. So let's kick off with AWS organizations. This is a free service, and we think that every customer should use that to centrally manage and govern your cloud environment. Lots of advantages with organizations, things like consolidated billing, delegated administration account, centralized application of governance policies. Now, governance policies would be applied using what we call service control policies, or SCPs. And you can do that consistently across all of your accounts. And you can use these SCPs in two ways. You can use them either as a deny list, so what that would do is prevent your development teams, your operational teams, from being able to invoke particular services or to carry out specific actions. For example, you could stop um, your operations team from being able to disable a security service like Amazon Guard Duty. Or what you could do is also use SCPs as an allow list, so that all the services and actions would be implicitly denied unless they're defined within the SCP. Now, we actually see most customers using SCPs as a deny list because the policy is actually a lot easier to manage. But ultimately, the choice is yours. Yeah, so AWS Control Tower is a great way for you to automate and manage setup of multi-account environments. So you can think about Control Tower as like your uh, account vending for the groups in your org. You can securely create accounts with um, AWS best practices and guardrails built in from the beginning. Um, and then you know, make sure that's consistent across your AWS environment, and then monitor all of it from the Control Tower dashboard. So Ben talked about guardrails, and what, what are they? So guardrails are pre-built rules provided to you through the Control Tower um, environment, ready for you to deploy into uh, your uh, overall AWS environment, and it allows you to have ongoing uh, governance. Now, guardrails are implemented in two ways, either as a preventative or detective uh, control. And what that allows you to do is to monitor the compliance and govern the resources um, and the configuration of those across groups of AWS accounts. A preventive guardrail makes sure that your accounts um, uh, maintain compliance because it doesn't allow, or rather, it disallows actions that would lead to a policy violation. On the other hand, a detective guardrail detects that non-compliance of resources within your account, like a policy violation, and it simply provides an alert to you through the cloud, um, the, the control tower dashboard, and you can then decide what action you wish to take upon that. So when you then extend the governance out to an OU that might, for example, contain um, an area of your business. Control Tower applies mandatory guardrails to that organizational unit or that OU within your org um, by default. And there are different types of uh, guardrails, and those that are mandatory are, are applied, as I've said. You get strongly recommended guardrails and elective guardrails, but those are not enabled by default. There's a total of 62 guardrails available today. 22 are mandatory, 13 are strongly recommended, and 27 are elective. Um, this slide uh, shows you uh, a number of guardrail examples. And uh, for example, this one here I'm going to draw your attention to is disallow creation of access keys for the root user. 
Now this is a preventative guardrail and that can help you secure your AWS accounts by disallowing the creation of access keys for the root user. Now if you do that, how do you then access it? We would recommend that you instead create access keys for the IEM users with limited permissions to interact with your AWS account. Now by default, this guardrail is not enabled, but there are over 60 guardrails available in total today. And what we've done is at the end of the deck, there's a QR code that you can snap, uh, snap and you can get access to uh, all of the documentation. Every single control uh, is provided in the control tower documentation. Yeah, I think, I think something important to point out about Control Tower is you could build this yourself with SCPs and policies and organizations, and many of you may already be doing that. Um, Control Tower can work in an existing environment now. It could be in a new environment you set up. And um, these guardrails, this 60 plus and keep adding, are the things that the customers are asking for the most. And so they're pre-built policies. So this is just a bunch of work done for you and like a, a way to make um, this easier and get that, um, you know, policies that you don't have to build and test and validate yourself. Yeah. So within the 27 elective guardrails that, that we provide for you, there is a subset of 18 that are dedicated to data residency. And in certain areas of, of the world, we know that that's super important. Now, these are great for things like preventing unwanted transfer of customer data, restricting application teams from perhaps violating your data residency requirements or preventing unwanted cross-region networking. So is this like out of the 18, and these are all new ones that we've added, you know, specifically around data residency, Alex, are, I know they're pre-built, but do they require a bunch of customization or are we literally talking about tick a box and turn that on? Yeah. I, there's no configuration work that you as a customer need, needs to do. What we've done is what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting, and we've pre-built those guardrails for you so that you can then rapidly deploy those across your entire AWS environment without needing, as I said, to configure it. And that's pretty neat because without really doing an awful lot of work, you're gonna get an awful lot of benefit from that. And by applying some or all of those, you get a long way towards detecting and inhibiting either explicit or accidental creation and sharing uh, or, or even copying of data outside of your selected AWS regions. So the first um, preventive guardrail that I've highlighted here is a new one. And we launched this at the end of 2021. And it's often referred to as the region deny guardrail. What this does is to prohibit access to AWS services based upon your control tower region configuration. So within Control Tower, you define which regions you wish to operate in and you enable this guardrail. And when you do that, it denies access to that. You don't have to do anything else, nice and simple. Important thing to remember about all of this is that there are certain global AWS services such as IAM and AWS organizations that are exempt from the guardrails because they're needed on a global basis to operate. Yeah, so you're not gonna like turn turn a region off and like yep. block yourself out of one of those yeah. services. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So you're not gonna Perfect. do that. Yeah. Yep. Again, you'll find all of this in the documentation, same QR code at the end of this deck. So let's go to AWS config. So this is an agentless service that automatically discovers, records, and continuously tracks the configuration of your AWS resources across all accounts and all regions in your org. You can use config to evaluate um, the configuration of your resources against specific compliance policies. So um, NIST 853, CIS, FedRAMP, and others using pre-built pre policies uh, for config that we call conformance packs. So as of today, there's about 70 conformance packs that are available and we're constantly updating and adding to this. You can also build your own config rule set. So if you have a like a mix of compliance policies you need to meet or a specific thing that, that you've come up with in your team between security and compliance for your organization, you can build that and deploy that um, rule set as well. Um, config detects configuration changes um, and can alert you through integration with services like uh, SNS uh, or CloudWatch events. And you could even trigger automated remediation. So if it was something that, you know, we never want this to happen and it doesn't matter um, you know, if somebody does it, we always back it out. You could build that right in. Yeah. And one of the great things about config is that because everything in cloud is an API, 
when that change is made and an API record is made, Config automatically knows about it. And so therefore, without needing to scan any of your resources, it understands what's happened. And it tells you right there and then, this is the activity that's happened without any impact to your service whatsoever. So it's a great service. Okay, so next up is Amazon Macy, which is our data detection and discovery service. The Macy's got a number of different features, um, which you can see here. But the one that we're going to focus on today is this one on the left, which is about gaining visibility and uh, evaluating your bucket inventory and bucket policies. So when you enable that, what you get on your dashboard is you get this uh, really great summary on the Macy dashboard, and it lets you really quickly see which of your S3 buckets are publicly accessible, which are encrypted, which buckets are not encrypted, and also any buckets that you might be sharing internally between accounts or even externally with, with uh, other organizations. And because Macy integrates with AWS organizations, as a compliance person, you can go to the delegated administration account, get a rolled up view of all of your S3 buckets across the entirety of your AWS organization. And that's the kind of thing that you can automate and then get a weekly summary email, just as an example. And then you would know how your developers and your operations teams are then complying with your organizational policies around data access. So Security Hub is a cloud security posture management service that can be quickly enabled um, and configured across your entire AWS organization. There's two main components of Security Hub that we're going to talk about. So continuous aggregation of findings um, uh, from a range of AWS services as well as partner services and the ability to run automated security checks. In both cases, Security Hub creates what we call a Security Hub finding which is in a standardized format called ASFF, so AWS Security Finding Format that um, works with our tools and a number of our uh, partner tools. Um, once Security Hub has a finding um, and it's been created, compliance and app dev teams can take action against those, um, or you can even automate remediation. And we're gonna talk about that, about that a little more later. So for now, let's focus on the conduct automated security checks component of Security Hub. So there's three security standards available today. The AWS Foundational Security Best Practices, or FSBP. Um, over 223 security controls uh, automatically check um, you know, posture of AWS services. Uh, CIS Foundational Benchmarks, which checks against um, a list, a uh, subset of the CIS requirements. And last, um, PCI DSS, so the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, and it checks against a, uh, a subset of PCI DSS. Um, when you enable Security Hub, it turns on FSBP and CIS by default. Um, but for the most part, we're gonna focus on FSBP because this is a set of security standards that's probably the most comprehensive out of all the things that Security Hub does. FSBP security standard is a set of controls that detect when your deployed accounts and resources deviate, deviate from AWS recommended best practices for those services. And the standard allows you to continually evaluate all of your accounts and workloads quickly so you can identify an area where you're deviating from best practices. And maybe, maybe you're doing that on purpose because it's something you need to do for your business. It's a risk you're accepting. Maybe it's just something you don't know. The really nice thing is for each one of these checks, we have prescriptive guidance on how to improve or remediate. So um, anybody using that service could follow those instructions and get to a, um, a best practice state for that service or that specific check. Um, next slide. Yeah, so um, how and where should we enable Security Hub? Um, you know, we recommend that you turn this on in all accounts in all regions. If you're using AWS organizations, that's as simple as going into the delegated administrator account and um, clicking a few buttons to enable Security Hub across all your accounts, meaning that we would be turning on FSBP and CIS for all of those. And we really don't have to do anything else past that. It would be on and start reporting rolling up all those findings to that delegated administrator account. If we start to look at um, who has um, responsibility 
to act on, you know, security hub or what responsibility each different team has. So if you're one of the folks that, you know, raise your hand, uh, IT security. Um, so you, you're probably the one that operationally goes and turns this on and manages that delegated administrator account. If you're in a compliance team, you may work with the security team to say, these are the checks that we need to look at and care about, review those findings and figure out, are we meeting, um, you know, like particular compliance goals and requirements for specific workloads. And lastly, um, you know, the development team, you know, or the groups running the accounts, depending on your organization and whether it's distributed or centrally run, um, those people may be the ones uh, addressing those findings and doing the remediations. It may be something that, you know, gets shared between uh, security and the dev team depending on, again, like that, that skill and experience in cloud that we talked about at the beginning. Okay, so let's now move on to our second capability, which is um, protect your infrastructure and data. And there are three services we're gonna to touch on in this section. So we've got AWS Firewall Manager, AWS Key Management Service, or AWS KMS, and also AWS Secrets Manager. AWS Firewall Manager allows you to centrally configure and manage firewall rules across your accounts and your applications using AWS organizations. So what that means is that as your developers create new applications, Firewall Manager makes it easy to bring these new applications and the resources into compliance by enforcing a common set of security rules. And therefore, what you now have is a single service to build those firewall rules, create those security policies, and enforce them in a consistent and a hierarchical manner across your entire infrastructure and all doing all of that from a central administrator account. So you can do things like uh, create uh, WAF rules for your ALBs, your API gateways. You can create uh, shield advanced protections, again, for your, for your application load balancers or for your CloudFront distributions. You can also configure uh, VPC security groups and audit your existing security groups. You can also deploy network firewalls across accounts and VPCs, and lastly, uh, manage those Amazon Route 53 Resolver DNS firewall rules. So when we think about who does what with AWS Firewall Manager, the security team is going to build those firewall manager policies. Perhaps you might do that either through infrastructure as code, or you can do it within the management console itself. Then the compliance team is going to review and approve those policies before being deployed. And you might also be checking the configuration to verify that policies are being applied in the right accounts and also to the right resources. And then your developers get to use and reuse those approved firewall manager policies without having to go raise tickets, ask for extra things to be uh, added into groups. Uh, if there's already a group that they can reuse, then it's gonna shorten the amount of time that it takes them to start building those products, but also at the same time, will ensure that you've got a level of compliance that's consistent across all of your accounts. Yeah, so ideally there then, like the development team or development teams can work with security and say, this is the thing we need yep. for these applications, get pre-built policies, yep. shorten their time to deploy by weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right, so your, your data is incredibly important. I mean, it's one of the most important assets to a business and um, protecting you know, your business means you have to protect that data. And uh, encrypting your data just provides an additional layer of defense against unintended disclosure. Um, you know, unless someone has the right permissions to decrypt the data, you know, they aren't gonna be able to see and read it. And there's several different places that you should consider encrypting your data. And if you look at the quote from Warner, our, our CTO, basically at this point, um, encrypting data everywhere you encrypt it should be the default practice. And you should only like have data unencrypted in places where you, you can't encrypt or there's some very crucial business reason not to do stuff. There's basically three states of data, you know, in cloud that we're looking at. So data at rest, and this is, you know, data stored, you know, for example, on S3 or RDS, uh, data in motion. So data going between our applications or between our application and our customers um, could be encrypted with TLS, for example. Uh, and then data in use, so application level encryption. We're gonna look at, at data at rest, um, or if we look at data at rest, uh, Alex, you know, how can we do this in a way um, you know, that's secure and cost-effective and consistent across 
our entire AWS estate? Yeah. Good question. So one of the ways that you can do that is to use AWS KMS, that key management service that we talked about earlier, and that's our fully managed key management service. What that does is um, it generates keys, and those keys are protected by a FIPS 140-2 validated hardware security module, or HSM, and it's soon to be a FIPS 140-3. We're currently going through an upgrade program. It's also integrated with over 90 AWS services, and the keys that are generated and contained within KMS are non-exportable. So that's by design. There's no way to export an encrypted KMS key from KMS. We've also got a whole suite of APIs that can be called to generate a data encryption key. And when you do that, it's used by the services like EC2, EBS, S3, and others to then go ahead and encrypt your data. We also have a set of really fine-grained um, security through uh, IAM policies and KMS key policies so that you can have you know, a really good security policy and absolutely define who can access which specific key and what they can do with that key. It's also integrated with AWS CloudTrail. And CloudTrail is a great place for auditing, regulatory, and for your compliance information. So another thing to note is that you can also create and manage you know, keys securely in the cloud and even import your own encryption key material if that's what your regulatory requirements mandate. So when we think about who does what with KMS, the security team is uh, managing the key access policies to allow the developers to create and use the keys. The compliance team will verify the configuration of keys, the rotation period, the algorithm that's used, et cetera and then review those access logs to make sure that the keys are not being misused. And lastly, the development team can create and use those keys programmatically to protect the data while at rest or in use. So the last service we're gonna look at in protect your infrastructure and data is AWS Secrets Manager. Secrets Manager allows you to manage, retrieve, and rotate secrets throughout their entire lifecycle with really one main goal, and that is to prevent developers from having to handle secrets themselves. So by adopting this approach, you, you can replace all hard-coded credentials that might be put in code, including passwords, with an API call to Secrets Manager, and it can retrieve that secret programmatically. So this helps uh, ensure that secrets don't get compromised or exposed by someone examining code um, because the secret's no longer in the code. Um, you know, if you can pick one service out of crypto to target first, if you're not using something like this and you have dev teams storing secrets in code, um, this is probably the first thing to, to go after. Um, so Secrets Manager offers rotation with built-in integration for RDS, um, Redshift, and DocumentDB. All secrets stored in Secret Manager are encrypted with a data key that's generated by KMS that you choose. Uh, and in addition, Secret Manager enables you to control ac access to secrets using, again, fine-grained permissions, and then audit that secret rotation centrally. So what you can see here on the screen is that within the AWS Secrets Manager service to the left-hand side, which is bounded by the pink box, Secrets are being encrypted, as Ben said, using AWS KMS, and we're using AWS Lambda to automatically rotate secrets on a schedule of your choosing within a range of services. Now, that service is also extensible to other types of secrets, so you could include API keys, OAuth tokens, you know, the possibilities are endless. And by integrating your applications with the API to pull those secrets at either launch or runtime, your developers no longer have to hard code the secrets or store them in plain text. And that is clearly going to improve your security and your compliance posture. So let's again think about who does what within Secrets Manager. The security team is going to manage those secrets. Perhaps they'll create those secrets, define the rotation schedules, manage the access to Secrets Manager. The compliance team is going to verify the configuration of the secrets and of Secrets Manager itself ensuring that the secrets are rotated as per the organizational policy and making sure that access is controlled and monitored again in line with your, uh, your compliance requirements. And lastly, the developers. Developers are going to get to use the secrets in the code. 
but importantly, they never actually get the secret itself, which was the whole point of what we were talking about. <clears throat> so detecting threats and vulnerabilities is a really important aspect of security operations. We're gonna dive into two services that can help you do this. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Amazon Guard Duty and Amazon Inspector. So Guard Duty is a fully managed, always on threat detection service that provides um, you with accurate and easy, an accurate and easy way to continuously monitor and protect your AWS, AWS accounts and workloads. Uh, with just a few clicks, Guard Duty immediately begins analyzing events from uh, a bunch of different AWS log sources in your accounts, specifically looking at um, identifying threats that are known malicious or represent behavior that is substantially different um, than usual and should be looked at. So Guard Duty looks at logs um, in your AWS account, specifically uh, CloudTrail management events, CloudTrail data events for S3, um, Route 53 DNS logs, EKS audit logs, and VPC flow logs. And Guard, Guard Duty uses a, um, a number of different machine learning algorithms, anomaly detection, and integrated threat intel uh, to identify and prioritize potential threats. Guard Duty is capable of handling uh, tens of billions of events, so it, it'll scale to you know, any size organization with any amount of logs. Um, it also uses the threat intelligence feeds such as malicious IP addresses or domains uh, to identify unexpected or unauthorized activity um, in your AWS account. So you can include issues like um, escalation, or this can include issues like escalation of privileges um, or exposed credentials, communications with malicious IP addresses, um, in like putting those things together, like I said, with the anomaly detection or machine learning to escalate, um, you know, into a higher priority. So uh, Guard Duty could detect a compromised EC2 instance that was serving malware or an instance that starts mining cryptocurrency because it's communicating with command and control IPs. Um, it also monitors AWS account access behavior for signs of compromise. So it can look at unauthorized in infrastructure deployments. Um, it can look at, you know, potentially like deploying things in a region that you've never used before, or maybe unusual API calls that would be going in and lowering security. Um, you know, for example, like password strength or other policies like that. Guard Duty informs um, you of the status of your AWS environment by producing uh, security findings in that same finding format we talked about with um, Security Hub. You can either view those in the Guard Duty console um, or in Security Hub, or you can send it um, through CloudWatch events as well. And just one point on the logs that Ben mentioned. We talk about uh, taking all those logs from CloudTrail and, and, and all these other sources. You do not actually have to enable those logs. So if you already have VPC flow logs, if you already have Route 53 DNS logs, that, that's great, that's fine. But the Guard Duty service uh, accesses those logs independently and you don't have to have those. So it's just an important point. Right. Yeah, it's, the service itself does that on the back end and, yeah. and you don't have to configure anything else for that yeah. to work. Right. Okay, so let's talk again about how and where you would enable Guard Duty. So you'll have heard this already, but our guidance would be for you to enable it on all of your AWS accounts and in all of the regions that you have enabled. Now, doing this in a region or an account where you expect to have no workloads is not going to cost you anything. But if something did happen, then you would get notified. Okay? And if you're using organizations, it's really quick and easy to enable member accounts from the Guard Duty console in your delegated admin account. And you can also auto enable Guard Duty for all new accounts. So that means that Guard Duty will automatically be enabled whenever your developers spin up a new account, uh, again, without you having to do anything. So let's look again at who has responsibility for what within Guard Duty. So the security team will configure Guard Duty to make sure that threat detection is enabled across all your accounts and regions. And the security team will also review and investigate Guard Duty findings to support the teams that will address the findings. The compliance team will review and track any guard duty findings that have been raised, supporting the teams to address the findings themselves. 
but they can also and should also work with the security team to enable or disable certain guard duty functionality in accounts where it may or may not be relevant. And lastly, the development teams can have read-only access to the guard duty console where they can look at the findings and go make the necessary changes to their infrastructure as code configurations to address the non-compliance findings that have been uh, established. So, that didn't go forward. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Yeah, so Amazon Inspector is an automated vulnerability management service that continuously scans workloads for software vulnerabilities and unintended network exposures. So once started, um, Inspector automatically discovers all your EC2 instances. It also discovers all your container images that are residing in the Elastic Container Registry. So if you're using ECR. And they're identified for scanning and then immediately start being scanned for software vulnerabilities or network exposures. So all workloads are continuously rescanned whenever there's a change. Um, so if you install um, new software on an EC2 instance, or if there's a new uh, CVE exposure, um, it will rescan for that information uh, to see if, if that CVE um, is in that uh, software in that instance. It generates um, really like very highly contextualized um, risk scores for each finding where it correlates the CVE, it looks at network reachability, and it also looks at exploitability data. So if it's a, a CVE, um, if the system is reachable publicly over a network, and then that exploit was um, remotely exploitable, then it would escalate that risk score up higher, you know, using all of those um, different metrics. This helps prioritize finding and highlight the most critical things that you know security team needs to be working on. And then um, all the findings are ag aggregated in the inspector console. Um, they're all routed to Security Hub. And then they can be pushed um, with Amazon EventBridge to automated workflows. So you could integrate this with your ticketing system. So if something pops, automatically pop a ticket and send it to the group that, that owns that resource. So let's talk again about this service and about how and where you should enable Inspector. Again, we think you should be enabling it on all of your AWS accounts and in all of your ECR repositories. And if you're using AWS organizations, then again, just like for Guard Duty and for Security Hub, it's quick and easy to enable those member accounts from the console and your delegated admin account. And again, you can also auto enable Inspector on all your new accounts and ECR repositories. So that therefore means that when uh, you know, uh, your developers are spinning up new accounts and container repos, Inspector is going to be automatically enabled and it's going to start uh, scanning those instances and container images for vulnerabilities, again, without you having to do anything, which is great. So once again, let's look at who has got responsibility for what within Inspector. The security team are going to configure Inspector to make sure that scanning is enabled across all accounts and ECR repositories. They'll also update suppression filters that are available. And that, what you can do with that is suppress findings based upon certain criteria that might be relevant for your particular use cases. And the security team will also review and investigate any inspector findings to support the teams that will ultimately address those findings. The compliance team are going to review and track any inspector findings that were raised, again, supporting the teams that will address the findings themselves. And they can also work with the security team to enable or disable certain inspector functionality in accounts where it may or may not be relevant and therefore make sure that suppression filters are in line with policy. And then lastly, uh, the development teams can have read-only access to in the inspector console to view those finding details and to go make the necessary changes to their software deployments to address the software vulnerabilities that have been discovered. Well, you can also not just suppress findings though, um, you can use tag policies to Absolutely. either like explicitly include or exclude like Absolutely. containers yep. or container repositories. Yeah. 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 So you could decide that you've got a container image that's tagged with latest and you only ever want to scan the container that's tagged with latest. Well, that, that's what you can focus on. Or you can focus on an EC2 instance that's tagged with a particular way. Yeah. If there's a sandbox and people are like just constantly yeah. genning containers over and over again while they're making something, it's just going to make a bunch of noise and they're probably going to be gone by the time you go look at it anyway, so things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the last thing we're gonna hit in detect threats and vulnerabilities is, uh, is Amazon S3. Um, we can take advantage of a number of features to prevent data from being tampered with or deleted, which um, you know, in the end protects the integrity of the data. It, data integrity is really important to a compliance team. That's not really a security service. I mean, S S3 is a storage service. Surely it's not a security service. Thanks yeah, much. yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, it can be, right? If we're gonna use some of the native S3 features. So um, S3 has object lock, so it can prevent an object from being deleted or overwritten for either a fixed period of time, you know, like a compliance window that we have to retain records for, or indefinitely, you can say, you can never delete this thing. Um, we can manage access to permission with S3 bucket policies. We can configure S3 versioning. Um, we can even use features like MFA delete to make sure that like someone can't delete it unless they have you know, multi-factor authentication to do that. And, and all of these things can restrict how data is being written or read. Um, and a, a lot of these things when used together, um, you know, end up letting us build something um, that we can use to store um, investigation logs, you know, maybe evidence. And um, you know, it's often referred to as like immutable data storage or immutable logs. That's pretty cool. But it does sound like there's now going to be a lot of uh, pretty sensitive data in these S3 buckets. So I'm assuming you're going to have to protect it in some way. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the best practice here um, we would recommend is to protect this data by using encryption with KMS. Uh, and we talked about that earlier and how you can um, use the appropriate IAM policies to protect the principals who have access to this data. And, and then an overall best practice from a compliance and audit standpoint would be to have a dedicated account where we store all of this log data, all this investigation, um, you know, or other security data separate from there in a way that, you know, the operations teams, the dev teams, uh, even the security teams don't have access to tamper that. So they send the data, it stays there, it's immutable, and it can easily be audited either by um, internal teams or uh, external auditors. All right, so monitoring security effectiveness, we're gonna go back to Security Hub and touch on you know, the piece we didn't hit earlier. So like I said, um, we can look at our cloud security posture um, and automate security checks, but the other part of Security Hub that's really helpful is the ability to aggregate findings from a bunch of different AWS services and a bunch of partner services. So bringing this in, pr prioritizing them so you can take action uh, on these findings um, you know, that are important to you. And this can either be in Security Hub itself, um, or if you have a SIM um, and a SOC set up and, and are doing that, Security Hub feeds into those with the this, this, this same data. So as well as ingesting findings from a set of partner solutions, Security Hub can also ingest uh, sensitive data findings from Amazon Macy that we talked about earlier findings from guard duty, and also any security issues that inspector found in your EC2 instances or ECR container images. And then once you've got all of those Security Hub findings from across your AWS organization, Security Hub prioritizes those for you. And our guidance when you have all of those is to remediate any findings that are critical and high as soon as you can. And then you probably want to think about prioritizing a subset of findings in accounts that you deem to be critical to your organization or might be related to some customer facing services. It's also recommended that you would try to develop some either manual or automation runbooks and playbooks for handling the findings. And I just want to give a shout out to two other sessions that are happening tomorrow. There's a TDR371 and a BLD001, and they're going to cover how to do runbooks in a lot more detail. If you get the opportunity, you should go to that. And of course, it goes without saying that running a tabletop exercise on these playbooks and runbooks is really important to allow you to test out your organization response to security issues. So once again, let's think about who does what with Security Hub findings. So your security team are going to review and investigate those findings. They're going to be working with your compliance teams to prioritize and track those and then your developers are going to address your prioritized list of findings. 
So, now we've got some takeaways. We've covered all of those capabilities. So let's think about identify your assets and compliance requirements. We covered AWS organizations, AWS Control Tower, AWS Config, Security Hub, and Amazon Macy. Thinking about how to protect your infrastructure and data. We've got AWS Firewall Manager, AWS KMS, and AWS Secrets Manager. Thinking about detect threats and vulnerabilities. Amazon Guard Duty, Amazon Inspector, and Amazon S3 are your friends in that regard. And lastly, monitoring your security effectiveness, as we just spoke about, is AWS Security Hub. So, so really the call to action here would be um, deploying baseline services that are relevant to your environment. So if you saw something that could help here with problems you have or things you're trying to address, um, or even just opportunities to get better um, you know, at, uh, at, at what you're doing in cloud you know, with regards to security maturity, um, use the capabilities available in these tools, so guardrails in control tower and firewall manager, building those out to streamline things. Um, and then compliance controls that are built in for data residency and auditing. Um, and, and so really the, the way to get this started is to research and plan out what you wanna have in your operations baseline. Maybe it's a set of these services and some existing tools that you're already using on-prem and in cloud together. Um, and then figure out you know, which piece we wanna go after and start to address. So uh, if you need help, reach out to your AWS team, AWS partners or ProServe, if you need to you know, accelerate any of these. Um, and then one more thing from a, you know, just to hit the compliance piece again, the, the baseline set here were things that compliance teams often need. And so it's better to like look at these, evaluate when you're doing your research and think about it Am I gonna need this data down the road for something and not go ask the security team to turn something on you know, tomorrow when I could have you know, a year worth of data um, if we addressed it you know, earlier? So additional resources. So these hit all of the um, different areas that we talked about in more detail, um, specifically some automation, incident response, um, deep coverage on the control tower guardrails, and um, overall security reference architecture. That's, a, again, a good thing to look at, not only for baseline, but to start to uh, deploy more advanced controls. And then um, we are, since this is a silent session and there's no Q&A, um, Alex and I are gonna post up right outside of the, the area here. So anybody that does have questions, we're happy to hang out as long as you want and answer those. We appreciate everybody coming and uh, paying attention and hopefully that was helpful. So thank you very much for that. And, um, and then please do complete the survey. Um, we put these things together and do them, you know, 100% for you folks. And so um, fill out your surveys. If you thought we did great, you know, five's my favorite number. Um, if, uh, if there's things we could do better though, please, if you're not gonna put a five, leave us feedback so we can make this better for the next group. So um, that's all. Have a good rest of your show and um, enjoy the week here in Boston.